the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning is having its moment in the sun. Every organization worth its salt is finding avenues to weave the magic of AI into their way of work and grow their business. And yet, what good is artificial intelligence if it doesn't benefit the larger population? Our next guest has been answering that very question for the last 25 years. Nuria Oliver is the first Chief Scientist Advisor in Data Science at Vodafone, the Chief Data Scientist at Datapop Alliance, and the co-founder of ELIS, the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems. Her work involves building computational models of human behavior, studying computer interactions, human-computer interactions, and using data for social good. She has over 40 patents, a slew of awards, with the most recent ones being the Abbey Technology Leadership Award and the King James I Award for In New Technologies. She led the team Valencia IA for COVID-19 that won the most recent XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge. She has the honor of being the first woman computer scientist from Spain to be named an ACM Fellow and with over 21,000 citations, is one of the most prolific female computer scientists in the country. Nuria, welcome to HCM Bytecast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, no, entirely our honor as well. Um, I'd love to lead with a question that I ask all my guests, Nuria. Um, if you could please introduce yourself and talk about what you currently do um, and give us some insight into what led you into this field of work. Yeah, so I'm Nuria Oliver. I'm a computer scientist. I'm an expert on artificial intelligence. And I actually wear a lot of hats right now and I do a lot of things, but what I'm investing the most time on is in um, uh, launching and, and sort of like making grow a new nonprofit foundation that I've created called the Institute of Humanity Centric AI, which is um, the only ELIS unit that there is in Spain. ELIS means the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems and is um, a European Association of Scientific Excellence in Artificial Intelligence. I also advise a lot of uh, governments, universities, foundations, research centers, companies. I'm also involved with Data Pop Alliance, which is an NGO devoted to the use of data and AI uh, for social good. And I invest a fair amount of time in outreach activities to communicate both to technical and non-technical audiences uh, the main um, sort of like findings um, in my research area, which is uh, human-centric artificial intelligence. In terms of what brought me to computing, um, since I was very, very small, I've always been fascinated by the idea of an inventor or a scientist. I love mysteries. I love unsolved problems. I love questions that no one you know, knows the answer for or, or inventions you know, that no one thought about. So I was fascinated by figures like Leonardo da Vinci or Marie Curie or Albert Einstein. But of course, all these um, prominent scientists uh, were um, dead when I was uh, growing up. So I couldn't really ask them uh, you know, how they got where they were and, and what they did. So I wasn't sure what to study. I, I chose the um, scientific technology track in high school. And when I was in my last year of high school and I had to figure out what to study in university, I had a chance to talk to one of my brother's best friends who had started telecommunications engineering in Madrid, in Spain. And I met with him and he told me what engineering was about. He told me, um, you know, what technology was <laughs> for and, and what kind of like uh, uh, classes he had. And I basically um, came back from that meeting very inspired and convinced that uh, telecommunications engineering was what I wanted to study. So, so that's what I did. I went to Madrid and I did a six year program. Um, uh, in telecommunications engineering, it's like a bachelor's and master's program together. And maybe since third year, I fell in love with artificial intelligence. I, I, I discovered what artificial intelligence was, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do um, for the rest of my life, I guess. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's that's really um, inspiring. I mean, I think what you bring about is so critical as well, right? I mean, as young students, we're, you know, a lot of the times, um, you know, we're confused about what yes. we want to do and, and how do we discover these these new areas and having those mentors are, are so critical for us yes. to make those decisions. And like you said, is also that process of discovery um, and, you know, sort of you, you get into a field, but as you go deeper, there's like one class or one teacher that really sort of inspires you and then you sort of pursue that path. Um, so it's, it's really fascinating to hear about your journey in that manner. Um, but your work, um, you know, around HCI and intelligent user interfaces, Nuria, has been, you know, prolific since then. Um, would you care to talk about like some of the highlights that you feel across your career? I know a lot of your work now is in the nonprofit um, area, but in terms of your research, you know, some highlights from your journey that you would love to share with our audience? Yeah, uh, definitely. So. My 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 sort of like vague idea or my aspiration um, since I started studying engineering was to invent technology that would help people, to invent technology that would somehow help us have a better quality of life or would help us tackle the problems, you know, the big problems, the big challenges that we face. So I started working on um, computer vision, which is one field within artificial intelligence to make computers understand uh, videos and images. And um, I did, um, for my master's thesis, I did a project on um, detecting cars in highways back in 1994 um, to have um, better, safer driving and more sort of like accurate models of traffic and so forth. Then I went to do my, my PhD at MIT. And I continued working on um, what is called perceptual computing, which is not only computer vision, but also analyzing data coming from other kinds of sensors to help computers um, have an understanding of what is happening you know, around them. So I worked on uh, building smart rooms. For example, I did one of the first systems in the world to do facial expression recognition in real time. So the computers could understand our emotions, for example. I also worked on um, a, a gesture recognition system so that so we could interact with the computer you know using our own gestures and um, I built a smart car um, a car that was able to predict the next maneuver that drivers would do so we could have safer driver driving and I also had the opportunity to work on a smart clothes which was a concept that was being defined at the time, back in like 1996. Um, and basically, smart clothes are clothes that have technology embedded in them and uh, do something useful for their um, for people, the people that wear them. So uh, in 96, we organized the first uh, smart clothes fashion show in the world at the Media Lab. And I collaborated with some uh, design schools in the world, some of the best design schools. Um, and the designs that I uh, worked on were a female and a male version of a system to help um, people uh, who had a hearing disability and, and also they were mute, they couldn't speak, communicate with other people. So the design had a little camera that was pointing at the hands of the person. So when the person was talking using American Sign Language, the camera would capture the hands and um, uh, the outfits had a backpack where there was a computer, so the computer would recognize using artificial intelligence the, the signs that people were uh, signing and would um, interpret what they were trying to say and then using a voice, uh, uh, sort of like a text-to-speech synthesizer, the clothes would talk for the person. So there were some speakers also embedded in the in the designs. And then, you know, you would do your gestures and then the clothes would talk for you. So it would be assisted to help people communicate with people who didn't know um, American Sign Language. When I finished um, my PhD, I moved uh, to Microsoft Research and I continued working on this concept of building a smart anything. So I built a smart rooms, a number of smart offices and rooms, an office that would know what you were doing. So it could um, help you um, avoid interruptions. So it would help other people know better when to call you or when to um, uh, reach out to you. 
I also build with a colleague a system to manipulate the windows on your computer just using your gestures, something that today, you know, has become sort of like commonplace, but back in the year 2000 or 2001 was like really, um, you know, very novel. And um, in 2005, I realized that if I wanted to build technology that understood us and that helped us, probably the most personal computer, even back at the time, was the mobile phone. So I decided to shift my attention almost exclusively to the mobile phone. And I built some of the early works on um, sort of like using the phone as a computer, not as a phone. So I built a system to detect a sleep apnea. I built another system to help people achieve their exercise goals using persuasive computing. Uh, in 2007, they offered me the opportunity to come back to Spain. I'm originally from Spain to create and lead a research team and, and the, re the entire research area of uh, data science and AI within a very large telco in Spain, Telefonica. So we took on that challenge. We moved back to Spain from the US. And since then, um, joining a, a big telecommunications company opened up an entire world of opportunity in terms of analyzing large scale um, human behavioral data captured by the mobile network infrastructure and, and using that data for social good. So one of the areas that I worked on since 2008 is how we can use this large scale human behavioral data for social good, for example, to help us better respond to natural disasters because we can understand how many people have been affected by the disaster and where they are to help us foster financial inclusion because we can automatically infer the socioeconomic status of a region, for example, to help us have safer cities. We did a system to predict crime hotspots, for example, in cities, and also to help us better respond to pandemics and infectious diseases. So these are some of the, I guess, topics that I've worked on over the years. And as I mentioned earlier, since uh, for the past few months, I have been the director of this new institute, and the main focus of the institute is to do scientific research on uh, artificial intelligence for social good. I think that today, more than ever, we really need to invest in um, sort of like intellectually free research on understanding the societal implications of artificial intelligence and on inventing and developing artificial intelligence algorithms and methods and systems that actually have people's well-being um, at the core and as the main goal for the systems, as opposed to having other interests like maximizing the amount of time that we, that we spend using the systems or, you know, maximizing the amount of money that companies make as a result of that. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that because, you know, that's one of the things that I also gathered as I was, you know, studying your work in preparation for this conversation was the fact that you've been harnessing the power of mobile data for so many years and the applications that you've been working on have such relevance in our lives even today. I mean, and you were obviously working on these many, many years ago. Um, but I'd love to tap into this idea that you were talking about, which is really, I mean, this is something that has, I think, guided your career from what I can tell, um, which is the you know, using of data science for social good. Um, it almost as if, you know, you kind of had a crystal ball when you were, I know you were talking, I mean, you know, many of your very, very early interviews were looking at the impact of, you know, people moving and, and the spread of the pandemic. I know you were looking at the H1N1 outbreak, um, you know, way back when. Um, and, you know, the the value that you may have gotten from those studies and how it sort of has, you know, I was wondering if you could talk about, like, how has it helped you sort of respond to, you know, the COVID pandemic and and sort of help guide, um, you know, your, um, you know, the governments or the, the organizations that you work with? Yeah, so there is a world movement uh, that I belong to on uh, leveraging this large scale data, you know, that there is. Um, to uh, support uh, better public dis public policies and better decisions, decisions that impact the lives of millions of people. The idea is to move into what is called evidence-driven policymaking or even evidence-driven decision-making. So as opposed to coming up, coming up with policies that are based on intuitions or obsolete knowledge or political interests, 
to transition to a situation where those policies are actually informed by evidence and by scientific sort of like results. So in this context, and having worked on the use of data analyzed using machine learning methods in the context of pandemics since 2000 and basically 9, 2010, where my team at Telefonica, we did a project on the H1N1 flu outbreak. And then with my team at Vodafone, I did a project on the uh, Ebola outbreak that took place in DRC. And at the time when, uh, back in uh, February of 2020, when the um, uh, COVID-19 was starting to uh, exist and spread, actually I was working with my former team at Vodafone on a project on modeling the spread of malaria in Mozambique, leveraging uh, large-scale mobile data. So I felt, so as, as I saw that the pandemic was going to happen, I really felt compelled to reach out to the government in Spain and the government in, in the Valencian region of Spain, which is sort of like this, so the equivalent would be the, the state, you know, where I mean, Spain has a federal model like the US and we have 17 autonomous regions, which would be like equivalent to the states in the US. Um, to reach out to them and, 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 and offer them this idea of creating a team of um, scientists and experts working very closely with the policymakers so they could leverage all this knowledge and all these um, uh, methods that we have today to support you know, their decision making. So my proposal was very well received by the presidency of the Valencian government in Spain and immediately they said yes, um, I, we think this is a great idea. Let's create a data science for COVID-19 team that you will be leading. So they reached out to all the scientists in the region, in all the universities and research centers that um, had any kind of like background that was relevant. Um, they organized a meeting. I um, explained my vision for what we could do and the different areas that we would work on for modeling large-scale human mobility, to building computational epidemiological models, building predictive models of hospital occupancy and, and uh, intensive care occupancy, also to infer the prevalence of the disease because at the time there were no tests, and also um, reaching out to people in a very large-scale citizen survey that we launched in March of 2020 and is still active called COVID-19 Impact Survey. So based on my kind of like my description and I guess my enthusiasm, um, uh, more than 20 scientists said that they wanted to join the team. And we created this virtual team. This was March of 2020. You know, we were in, in lockdown at the time. It was the very beginning of the pandemic. So I organized meetings every day. Uh, with a team that I had never seen in person and, and that I had actually never worked with before. And I didn't have a chance to actually meet them in person until over a year later. Um, but we, uh, we saw each other every day and we worked really well together, very intensely, you know, for many, many, many months. So I wrote um, uh, reports every day with predictions of the day on the number of cases, number of hospitalizations, number of deceased, uh, number of intensive care uh, unit occupancies, reports on relevant topics, reports on summarizing the results of the survey. And um, I felt that, you know, we were really listened to and that our results was our results and our recommendations were really considered. And I think one of the key uh, elements for the success of our team is that a policymaker, the director general for public policymaking, is actually a member of our team, even though she's a politician and she works for the president of the region. So having this multi-institutional, multidisciplinary team where the policymakers are committed, active members of the team, I think is absolutely necessary. She made, she came to every single meeting every day. She made a huge effort in understanding the results of our work, understanding what we were doing, helping us prioritize our work, uh, providing questions for us to answer and translating all these technical results into actionable insights that they could use to support their policy making. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the, the experience uh, that we've had in the Valencian region of Spain. Because of the uniqueness of this initiative, we've received 
um, uh, some international recognition. So we've been featured in different international media like Wired or Politico or MSNBC. And we've also got some um, uh, international sort of like validation of our work when we um, um, and when we participated in the um, X Prize Pandemic Response Challenge competition, and we actually won it, which was really amazing. Yeah, truly, truly amazing. Congratulations um, for that. Um, there are so Thank many you. things in your, you know, in your answer that that struck me as as so amazing. I mean, one thing is just the, you know, the fact that you had the vision to actually reach out and be proactive about the help that you could provide. Um, you know, to the government. I mean, that's that's a significant uh, sort of, I would say, a, a factor in the success of this entire project. Um, the fact that the government was progressive enough to be able to recognize the value that you could bring and the commitment, yeah. right? Like you said, bringing that policymaker in and being an integral part of that team um, shows a, a level of commitment that, you know, you're going to use this work and use it in a meaningful way, uh, which is very encouraging, I'm sure, to the entire team. But what is amazing to me, uh, Nuria, is also when, you know, oftentimes when we're working on a really critical project, uh, you know, especially as as a leader of that project, you like to assemble your team because you kind of have a vision of like, hey, these are the skills that I need um, in order for me to sort of, you know, take this vision into reality. Um, in your case, it almost felt like somebody else assembled that team for you. How did that work and how did you make that sort of, you know, be successful um, in the initiative that you were driving? Yeah, so so that's a good question. I mean, everyone volunteered, so there were a lot more people in this original meeting. Um, and out of this, I don't know, maybe there were forty people or something. So twenty plus, I don't know, twenty, I don't know, I don't remember the exact number. Twenty two, twenty five uh, decided to volunteer, and um, I I had a vision for the different uh, work streams that we were going to have and the different um, sort of like expertises that we were going to need. So we try to find the best match between the different people that wanted to help and wanted to volunteer and then what we needed, you know, and what we wanted to do. To me, as much as um, um, scientifically and and um, also societally we have had impact, I have to say that at a personal level, it has been an extremely fulfilling, enriching, you know, unique experience because I've, I've really thoroughly enjoyed working with this team if if there is something that we are proud of is that you know we've worked really really well together. Um, we've never had a single conflict or um, this you know argument or um, you know fight you know among anyone. And it's a pretty large team. And I think one of the reasons is because we were all um, joined and and united for a common purpose. And that purpose was was really drove us, you know, to be working for so many, many months. Well, I mean, for two years now um, on, on that particular topic. And we worked, you know, day and night and weekends and holidays. You know, no one was asking anyone to do it. But we all had this really strong drive to to try to help. And we and we felt that, you know, we could help. Um, so. Yeah. So I don't know how that happened. I think in partly is because of the of this common purpose that really brought a lot of meaning to everyone. And I think also partly is because it was it was a refreshing experience in the sense that we didn't have any hierarchy, we didn't have any bureaucracy. You know, everyone could help. You didn't have to ask permission to anyone. Um, there was no boss really. So we had both from undergraduate students to full professors. We had the whole range of um, seniority. So it was a very diverse team. And it was really, um, you know, a meritocracy. It was a really a flat, you know, structure. It didn't matter who you were. You know, everyone wanted to join. Everyone wanted to help. You know, we, we allocated tasks that needed to be done and people took on responsibilities that they were accountable for and you know because we met every day we could actually be very dynamic in responding to new needs you know or new analysis but also um there was no no one had to ask permission to anyone no one had to fill out any forms no one had to apply for any grant you know we were just like really hands-on you know let's do this uh because we can help and and you know we feel there is nothing more important to do you know right now so i think everyone felt and um, felt there was a great way of working compared to 
the, I guess, normal way, which uh, particularly in Europe, in academia, is very bureaucratic and is very hierarchical. So it's very rare to have an opportunity where you can just like, you know, uh, be free to work on whatever you want. Usually you need to ask for funding, you need to um, uh, apply for grants, you have to teach, you have to all this like hierarchy. You, If you are a postdoc or if you are a student, you really don't have a lot of, you know, autonomy. And I think the fact that this theme was the opposite to that, you know, was very motivating to people. And and the same happened with the X Prize competition. You know, we had from students to professors all working together. And um, I think it was very inspiring to everyone, including to me, because I realized that, you know, there is talent everywhere. And many times it's not a lack of talent, it's a lack of an environment that enables that talent to flourish and to grow and to realize its potential. And many times the environment doesn't allow that, you know, it's too restrictive or it's too bureaucratic or it's too hierarchical and it demotivates people. So for me, it was also very inspiring because having lived outside of Spain for a long time, uh, realizing, you know, that there's this amazing talent anywhere that we can not only have local impact, but also win a, a world, you know, international competition um, was really uh, a surprise even, you know, uh, that a, a very positive surprise that I felt it was very inspiring because I realized, wow, you know, anyone can do anything if they, if they uh, you know, if they set themselves to it. Yeah, what a what an incredibly valuable lesson um you um you bring up Noria, which is really about you know one uh you know when when a team gets together with a common purpose um and that purpose is really in solving a problem for the greater good um it definitely inspires us and the fact that you know I think having this sort of flat structure empowers yeah. everybody to really. Uh, participate in a way where they're bringing their best ideas. You're not sort of intimidated. You don't feel like there are any repercussions and you're really all, you know, all gunning for the same goal. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's really inspiring to even hear about the way you describe it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, I would also love to know, um, so, you know, as a result of this work, how did you, how did you all measure the efficacy of your work, right? What were the sort of metrics you used to sort of constantly guide you and say, yes, we're moving in the right direction, or maybe, hey, we need to sort of change course? Well, I mean, we had daily feedback and constant feedback because we were uh, having daily meetings. Uh, I was writing daily reports, you know, with predictions. So we had this constant feedback on, on, on whether we were doing, you know, well or not, and whether our analysis were being valuable or not. So that was, it was fairly um, uh, immediate, you know, and, um, and that also gave us the opportunity to uh, react, to do new analysis if they were needed, to uh, adjust, you know, things. So we did have a very, um, close interaction in a very short cycle, which was just um, daily, maximum daily, you know, sometimes, you know, more than once a day. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess some of the, there were, there, there were a few um, moments where, where maybe we felt proud of our work. Um, one was uh, in the, after Christmas of uh, 2020, 2021. So January, 2021, right after Christmas, um, uh, that was the third wave of infections, and that was the worst wave of infections in, particularly in the Valencian region of Spain. And um, our model worked really, really well. That was the model that we had developed for the X Prize. Um, it was a very stressful moment where there was a lot of concern about a potential collapse of the healthcare system because the number of cases was growing exponentially, the number of hospitalizations, the number of intensive care units occupied. And there was a lot of uh, uh, um, pressure and need to have good predictions, to really prepare and to really order, you know, ventilators, you know, and, and to really um, free um, hospital rooms and so forth. But the need to have some somewhat accurate predictions, you know, to be able to prepare. And, our model worked, worked really well. I mean, at some point, I, I even warned the government, well, maybe you shouldn't put too much faith in this model because at the end of the day, it's just a model that we built, you know, we haven't really 
this, I mean, no one knew with this pandemic, right? Um, the, the virus was also mutating and, but yeah, it worked very well. And, and we felt really happy and relieved that our predictions were so accurate and that we could really help. Something similar happened just recently with the sixth wave, with the Omicron wave, where our model also um, worked really, really well. And in, in both cases, it predicted very accurately the day of the peak of the infection and the number of cases at the peak of the infection. Um, uh, so we could see how we helped. We also helped in changing um, the perception of the pandemic. So I remember back in uh, beginning of April of 2020, the president wanted to give a speech to um, to tell citizens when there wouldn't be any more uh, cases, you know, when somehow the pandemic would be over. And we told them that that was not possible to tell that the virus was going to continue to exist and the virus is going to continue to um, um, infect people. And moreover, that we hadn't reached herd immunity and that they the, with very high likelihood there was going to be a second wave of infections, right? So, and he listened to us and he, nev and he never said anything related to, oh, you know, we've defeated the virus or, you know, this is over, you know, when the first wave of infections, you know, uh, finished. So I felt, I felt, um, you know, happy to have uh, been able to, um, pr to bring maybe a little bit more realism, you know, to the the speech and the discourse, and then finally, probably the the longest lasting impact has been on the digital transformation that the public administrations and the governments need to undergo, but they hadn't undergone yet before the pandemic. And I think our experience and seeing the value of being a data driven organization and a digital you know organization has really inspired the government into um, uh, transforming itself and even uh, thinking of creating a data science unit within the government so they can have more evidence-driven policy making you know, as the status quo, you know, as the normal way of operating and working. So to me, having contributed to this, um, I guess, long-term, you know, lasting uh, impact of changing um, the, the way that the government works is probably one of the um, I guess, most uh, impressive outcomes from my perspective, because most uh, large companies had already undergone many, many years ago this digital transformation, but many governments hadn't. And I think we've paid the price, you know, with this pandemic in terms of the lack of data, the lack of like, it's been a, it's been a complete chaos, you know, in many cases. And, and I think seeing the value through our project has really inspired them into realizing that they need to uh, become more digital and they need to become more data driven. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm sure that that must be an incredibly rewarding sort of outcome, um, simply because you, you know, you demonstrated the value of actually, you know, sort of being digital first, and you know, to see that change happen as a part of the um, the government, as a part of the the region that you're in and the country is very inspiring, and that's incredibly impactful work. So, um, you know, amazing to hear about that. Um, Nuria, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, one of the other initiatives that you work on. I mean, I was, again, reading through your bio, I, I, I'm amazed at the amount of, of, you know, sort of the varied interests that you have and the impact that you drive in so many different arenas. But one of the things that stood out was the um, uh, Data Pop Alliance and the work you do um, in that organization. Um, I'm wondering if you could take us through that journey. Like, how did you hear about it? Um, you know, how did you get involved? What is it that you do for them? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, since 2008, I've been working on the topic of like data science and AI for social good. And Data Pop, I think maybe was created in 2014, maybe I can't remember exactly the date. Um, it is uh, an initiative created by the MIT Media Lab, um, the uh, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative the Overseas Development Institute and Flowminder. So I did my PhD at the MIT Media Lab and, and the main professor behind um, Data Pop Alliance from MIT is Sandy Penland, who is my PhD advisor. So I think I got 
probably to know about it through through him and um, uh, Emmanuel uh, or Manu Letouze, who is the co-founder and director of Data Pop Alliance. So I guess you know we started kind of collaborating. Initially, I was um, can't remember the title, some kind of like I don't know, I don't know, research affiliate or something like that. But since two thousand and <sighs> 16, I think I am the chief data scientist, and basically I just help in whatever way I can in whatever project I can. So, uh, Data Pop has a different um, areas of activity from doing data driven research projects in developing economies to doing public policy making and helping draft uh, policies and writing sort of like thought leadership articles. Uh, in the area of data, AI, and social good and development, to doing education and outreach and data literacy programs, um, and basically, I'm available to help, you know, in whatever way, depending on the project and depending on the timing. You know, uh, today, for example, I just had a meeting with Manu just a little bit earlier today, so it's sort of like a flexible arrangement where. I help as much as I can in in whatever you know capacity I can, depending on the project. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, looking at the the alliance team itself, um, Nuria, you know, it seemed to be an incredibly sort of geographically diverse team. Um, and so, is it that you know each member sort of brings the sets of challenges as well as the the you know the ideas that have worked for them? to the alliance and and sort of helps in in knowledge sharing is that a part of the work that you do also you know i know that you've always been a huge proponent of diversity in all of the teams and all of the efforts that you've worked with um you know what is the greatest value that you see from like this cohort of people that you work with well i mean data pop is a very special initiative it's extremely and multidisciplinary and diverse and um uh, as you can see on the website, um, I'm also very proud that in terms of like gender diversity is also, you know, very balanced uh, to be an initiative that is about data and AI, you know, and, and, and social good. And, and basically, depending on the project, depending on the geography, different members of the team work on the project. Um, data Pop has a, a lot of different uh, funding agencies from the Rockefeller Foundation to, you know, United Nations, different different uh, institutions in the United Nations, to the French Agency for Development, the Inter-American Development Bank. So there's many different um, foundations and organizations that fund the work that the Data Pop Alliance does. And the scope of the work um, geographically is mostly developing economies um, in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also in some um, Asian countries. Um, and as I mentioned, in terms of the nature of the work, we do both work in terms of using data to better understand um, issues, for example, inequality, discrimination, migrations, violence, crime, um, you know, and so forth. Uh, we also do projects and actions in terms of education, a lot of like workshops and courses. Uh, and then we also do projects in terms of uh, supporting um, policymakers and governments draft uh, strategies or, you know, really impactful projects that would enable them to become more data centric, um, always with the goal of having positive societal impact. So when a project is defined, then a team is created and um, uh, you know different people from Data Pop join uh, the project and then sort of like the, the project is sort of like executed, you know, and, and carried out, yeah. Great, yeah, I mean, that sounds, uh, sounds like an incredible opportunity. Is it mostly um, volunteer driven, uh, Nuria? Like, you know, can anybody no, join I mean, or how does this work? No, there are um, there are um, employees from Data Pop, and then there is also um, volunteers. So it could be both, depending on the on the project. Yeah, um, probably if anyone is interested, you know, um, the best is if, if they could just email um, either the director Emmanuel Letouze or someone. I mean, there's a lot of information on the website on 
also how to contact. Uh, but yeah, um, and the the Institute of Humanity Centric AI that I created, which is also a nonprofit. Um, obviously, we we have a lot of collaborations also with the Pop Alliance. Uh, uh, but the focus on the um, the Institute of Humanity Centric AI is um, is a scientific research. So um, it's um, we do outreach activities as well, but it's less, I guess, less broad than Data Pop, which covers a lot of uh, maybe not so much scientific research as more, you know, uh, working directly with countries and organizations to have impact. And in um, the Institute of Humanity Centric AI, we focus more on inventing new, you know, algorithms or carrying out research projects that uh, reveal the impact that AI um, is having on our society and on our lives. And in many cases, they're not so positive impact <laughs> that is having. Got it. Yeah, no, and then I think it's important to actually be aware, right? And then I think that's the only way to sort of make the impact. So I think sometimes the results may not always be, um, you know, the greatest that we want to hear of, but I think awareness is, is so crucial in order to be able to tackle those problems. I mean, exactly. I mean, if you don't know, yeah. uh, it's very difficult. You're going to change it, right? So the first thing is to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to go back to something that you said earlier um, around the team itself at Datapop and, you know, the both in terms of um, geograph. I know I brought up geographic diversity, but you brought up gender diversity. I know that's something that you're very passionate about, Nuria, about really starting, um, you know, early in terms of, um, you know, inspiring um, and educating um, young girls into the world of, of technology, as well as, um, you know, uh, data science and AI in particular. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Um, about gender diversity, you mean? In, yeah, just uh, your sort of interest and in the work that you've done, you know, your thoughts around like how we can improve, um, you know, how, and inspire young girls to be in data science. Yeah, so so we have a big societal challenge here, particularly in Western Europe and North America which is the progressive loss of uh, female talent uh, into computer science. This um, wasn't always like this. Uh, in fact, uh, up to the mid 80s, uh, the percentage of women in computer science was actually increasing. But then since the mid 80s has been decreasing. And right now there are a lot of degrees, for example, in Spain that have less than 10% of of girls, um, they are all within computer science. So I don't know, robotics or, I mean, different kind of like branches of computer science. Um, this is obviously undesirable because we live in a technological world. We need technology to survive as a species. And however, uh, this technology that we all use, no matter who we are and where we are, has been designed by non-diverse teams. And we know that this has severe implications in terms of how innovative that technology is, in terms of how inclusive that technology is, and also um, um, economically in terms of, you know, um, uh, how much money one could make, you know, with those results. Um, only in Europe, for example, the lack of gender diversity in the technology sector um, is um, uh, attributed to cause in the sort of like billions of like euros so that so that's something that has worried me for many years and i have lived um, also the difficulties because i have created research teams and it's been extremely difficult to find female um uh, scientists with a phd in computer science that could join uh, the teams even now i'm trying to recruit a lot of uh, scientists for the institute of humanity centric ai and it's very hard to find female uh, uh, PhDs, uh, so in, in artificial intelligence. So if anyone is listening uh, that could be interested, please reach out to me. Um, so I've done everything I've, 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 I, I could to, to try to um, inspire, um, in general, young people, because we don't have enough young people, but particularly girls and, and female adolescents, like teenagers, to pursue uh, careers in, in computer science and in technology. Um, I have also um, joined different initiatives that have as an objective to increase gender diversity in the tech sector. So I am a, a fellow, I'm a member of the Spanish Royal Academy of Engineering, 
And the Spanish Royal Academy of Engineering has a project called Women in Engineering, and I am the um, um, fellow, um, I guess, director of the program. So the program has an executive director, but it ha who is not um, a member of the Royal Academy, and it has to have a director who is a member of the Royal Academy. So I'm that person. I'm also a member of uh, um, an initiative called Women at the Table that. Um, uh, aims to have more women at the table, I guess, at the decision table. And then it has an initiative on algorithmics, algorithmic discrimination, like uh, gender um, discrimination on algorithms. I'm also a member of that. So I, I, I've, I've actually helped create uh, and organize very large um, conferences for students so they can learn about technology and they can see role models that are you know, female and that are not the stereotypes that the TV, you know, series or the movies or the books show to us. So they realize that computing is also, you know, for girls and, and is a, well, it's the best <laughs> profession that you could have. Um, so yeah, so I think the main message is um, we, we have um, um, really a societal challenge here that we need to tackle because we should not, as a society, uh, accept that the technology that we all use hasn't been designed by diverse teams. We should not accept that, you know, I guess the richest sector right now in the world doesn't have a good representation of women. Um, and we are failing as a society to inspire the next generation of girls and boys, but particularly girls, you know, to pursue careers in a field and a sector that has the, the lowest levels of unemployment, you know, and the and the largest, you know, levels of opportunities. Um, and we do, we do need to act. If we don't do anything, the situation is not, not going to get resolved by itself. And that's why, um, you know, we need to implement many, many actions from transformations in the education system to creation of role models to... Um, a, a given greater visibility and recognition to women, to you know, removing the uh, the uh, the pay gap, to um, supporting the women that are in the field. As you probably know, certain sectors in the computing field actually have cultures that are um, very uh, aggressive against women, and that is completely unacceptable. So there are many different actions that we can take. Uh, at different levels, you know, and and, uh, and targeting um, um, women and, and and people of different ages. Uh, but yeah, I think we definitely need to do something if we want to revert the situation. Yeah, no, no. Thank you for for sharing that. You covered so many of the sort of challenges we face today. And, you know, I mean, and I'm really grateful that you actually shared, um, you know, many of the actions that you're taking that could possibly inspire, um, you know, our listeners, um, you know, to to also pursue those opportunities in the, you know, in the areas of the organizations that, are, that they're in. Um, you know, one thing I've always believed is that you can't be what you don't see. And I, I know for a fact, uh, Nuria, that, you know, the the diverse set of opportunities that you have taken on and, um, you know, the fact that you share so much of your work and your, um, you know, your journey with, um, you know, students and, and, you know, women across the world is inspiring in and of itself because, you know, I, I think as a young girl, anybody looking at like what can be achieved, looking at your journey will certainly um, feel more empowered to go and pursue that herself. Um, you know, this has been an amazing conversation, uh, Nuria. For our final bite, I'd love to understand what are you most excited about, um, you know, in the field of, you know, data science and AI um, over the next few years? Well, I guess I'm really excited about what I've always been excited about, which is, you know, the, the, the huge power and the huge potential that we have to have positive societal impact, you know, through AI to really help people, all people, not just some people, you know, have a better quality of life, to really um, tackle the big challenges that we face from climate change to the energy crisis, to the aging of the population, you know, thanks to artificial intelligence or with the help of artificial intelligence. So I'm really motivated by all these opportunities, but I'm also uh, cognizant and very much aware of the fact that that potential is not going to be 
realized if we don't work for it and if we don't make sure that it will happen because there is also a dark side and a negative side in the use of AI. And that's what has moved me into creating this uh, nonprofit research foundation to make sure that I do everything I can in contributing to um, making sure that AI is the best thing that happened to us and not the worst thing <laughs> that happened to us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that and for the very inspiring conversation. Um, we really are appreciative that you took the time to spend with us at ACM Bytecast. No problem. It was been really a pleasure. Thank you for your interest and congratulations on your podcast. Thank you.